Uh, here's our agenda. So first thing we're going to talk about, oh, we got someone all the way from uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Thanks for popping out, Lionel. Uh, what is a constraint? We'll talk about what a constraint is. We'll talk about the, the novel, The Goal. And Dr. Eliyahu Goldratt, who authored the novel and is the, uh, the author of the theory of constraints and many of the practices and, and theories within the theory of constraints. We we'll talk a little bit about the five focusing steps, and that's a thinking process for remediating constraints that we discover. We'll talk a little bit about the drum buffer rope paradigm, and this is a way of injecting change into your organization to diffuse and eliminate constraints. And then we're going to go through a few real life concrete examples of how the theory of constraints is used and how it can help us. And then uh, we'll take a break from that and we'll jump right into question and answer time. So uh, without any ado, let's just jump right on into it. So we're here to answer the question, what's a constraint? And this is a picture, it's kind of a diagram of a constraint. And a constraint we could define as anything in a system that limits a system from achieving its maximal performance or from achieving higher performance on whatever its goal happens to be. Almost everything we look at is some sort of system and every system does have constraints. Uh, we sometimes substitute the, the term bottleneck for a constraint because they do kind of mean the same thing. We like to think of a bottleneck as a particular sort of constraint as we'll get into in a little bit. And the purpose of this diagram is to show you kind of the basic elemental thinking about what a constraint is, okay? And what we know is that no matter how much water we pour into either the blue tank or the red tank or the green tank, no matter how much we control the flow between the blue and the red and between the red and the green, it will not increase the system's performance. The system's performance is constrained or limited by the element of the system that has the lowest throughput. And that's what a constraint is. So when we talk about constraints, we talk about taking a step back from our work or our value stream, taking a look at it objectively, finding the places where the bottlenecks are, where does the flow get hampered, and addressing those using the thinking processes that we'll talk about tonight. So this is a very high level abstract example of what a constraint is. We can also think of a constraint as a weak link in a value chain. So if this is our chain that represents our value and we have to do quite a heavy lift, we can already see where the weak part of this system is. I have a piece of string holding a chain together. And the, the moral of the story here is that if I want to improve the overall strength of this chain, it doesn't matter what I do to the steel links, it will still be weak until I address the weakest link. And that's why in the theory of constraints, uh, we reiterate over and over again how important it is to find the most important, the, the biggest constraint, and deal with the biggest constraint before dealing with other constraints. Uh, so this is a classic example of, of an emergency. We know where we need to uh, do our dealing. Uh, the good news is, is that when we strengthen the weakest link, it always impacts the strength of the entire chain. And we always, always target strengthening the weakest link first without exception. And we could say, the moral of the story again is, that every system has some sort of constraint on it or every system would have unlimited perfect throughput and performance. So we know that every system has constraints. It's our job as lean thinkers or uh, as, uh, as uh, TOC thinkers to think about our work in these terms. So we'll get a little closer to the reality of constraints when we talk about the different kinds of constraints we might face. One example of a constraint is a people constraint, which means that I don't have people, I don't have workers to do my work. Uh, Frequently, we, 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 uh, we, we, we come up against this all the time. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the, the deli counter example. Time constraint, very, very common. Everybody deals with time constraints. 
Anything that's time critical limits our options. Uh, dependency constraint. That means that we have to wait for some other value to be produced before we can do further processing. That represents a constraint on our portion of the system. Sometimes we face specification constraint when we have delays due to incomplete, poorly understood, or other problematic specifications that we must resolve in order to continue with our work. A very common and unfortunately very pesky and frequent constraint is what we call a policy constraint. And a policy constraint or is a process or policy that's created by the organization with good intention, but that actually very negatively impacts delivery. In other words, the constraint of a policy is not worth the cost of the delay of the policy. And equipment constraint, physical constraint. I may have insufficient or inoperable equipment. I may have insufficient execution space in my virtual services. These are all common constraints. There are other kinds of constraints. It's a kind of exhaustive list. I'll go through a few more. Uh, talk about demand constraints on a market, which means that if the demand is less than the production capacity, we have a demand constraint. We don't want to produce more than the market will demand. Similarly, we have capacity constraints, which means that the, our ability to deliver to the market is less than the market demands, which means we have to increase our capacity to remove that constraint. Every now and then, we have a market constraint, typically, which is when a company entirely captures or corners a market, and it means that there's no room to grow, or it can also mean that a company's market has become obsolete or outdated. Very frequently, we deal with supply, the supplier constraints or material constraints when raw materials aren't available for production. We could also think about this both in the manufacturing sense and in the software sense that we have suppliers, the raw materials that we use to build our value. And lastly, the financial constraint, which everybody has to contend with, which means there's only so much uh, money on the money tree. We have to be able to purchase raw materials. We have to be able to process those. We have to be able to deliver those. Kind of, if uh, our in, we don't have the ability to purchase or process, then it's insufficient to meet the market demand. We call that a financial constraints. So constraints are actually everywhere. What's interesting about the theory is that it exposes so many of these things and the commonality of them is that they all somehow or another impact our ability to deliver most efficiently. Most efficiently. So let's get right down to the theory. We've, we've, we already talked about a constraint and we understand what a constraint is, but let's talk about what's the theory of constraints. What about them is interesting or compelling to us? And there's a couple of assumptions that we have to agree to before we can get it. And this is true of any theory. Every theory has what are called axioms, A-X-I-O-M-S. And axioms are assumptions or things that we say in order for our theory to be considered true must be accepted as true. And that these are broken down basically into these bullet points. That first bullet point, all organizations want the same thing. Uh, we presume good intent and we presume that all organizations want everybody in their organization and their customers and uh, everyone in their value chain to be successful. So we assume off the bat that everybody wants to win. In other words, there's no sabotage, there's no intrigue. This is not the theory to deal with that. And the second assumption is that they're, all organizations are measurable by these three characteristics and that these three numbers, these three metrics are the ones that we use to determine whether or not our theories about the theory of constraints in our organization are operable. So the first thing we have to know is what's our inventory? In other words, what have we spent? The second thing we need to know is our throughput. How fast does what we spend become what we gain? How fast does inventory become value? And three, what's our operational expense? Which is what is the cost of turning inventory into value? In the software world, inventory is our software. It only becomes valuable when a user is using it. Software that is not delivered has zero value, and we call that inventory waste in lean theory. Warren Buffett said, price is what you pay, value is what you get. We are looking 
uh, for maximizing value for what we pay. So with these assumptions in place, this is the, the theory of constraints distilled down to its purest form. At any given time, an organization is limited in achieving its goal by one or more identifiable, measurable constraints. So let's parse this a little bit. At any given time, and that means that when we look at it, right, sometimes the, the, the observation itself depends a lot on when and how we observe something. But we say that irrespective of when you observe something, every organization is limited. Um, and we are also asserting, as we did in our assumptions, that these are identifiable and measurable. There may be situations where constraints are not identifiable and measurable, but they fall outside the scope of the theory. And most people don't really run into those. And those are things that are, you, know, you would qualify as a disaster. Uh, the theory comes with, an, with a huge body of knowledge and some very uh, well-tested tools to identify and kind of deal with to what, what, uh, what Eliyahu Goldrack called to break or break through a constraint. When we talk in terms of the theory of constraints, we almost inevitably find ourselves using a manufacturing metaphor. And I've gotten a little criticism for that and I'm willing to take it. And the reason why I use a manufacturing metaphor is this is the metaphor that Dr. Goldratt used for the book, The Goal. And I think the idea of manufacturing, I think is at least to me, and I, I extrapolate this out to the wide world, that. The, the notions of manufacturing are easier to understand as a system than, for example, a complex organization that specifies, builds, and delivers software or healthcare or insurance or banking, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so manufacturing has a sort of uh, very kind of uh, bucolic simplicity to it that makes it an easy target for talking about uh, systems efficiency because of the importance of efficiency to any given system. Uh, we use value stream mapping for maximal effect. In order for us to understand the value stream, we have to be able to break it down and analyze the components, understand how it flows through a system. And we do that by looking for metrics that show the efficiency of a system. And we know that there are certain metrics that we axiomatically said we can get and we use those to wrap around our value stream mapping. We'll talk about that in a few slides. And that's what becomes our efficiency analysis. But we always focus on the big picture of efficiency. And the reason why we talk about things like big picture and systems thinking is because time after time, it's proven that doing targeted focused, uh, targeted focused change frequently only changes things so locally that they don't impact an entire system. So we have to come up with the big picture and then come up with simple solutions to deal with the problems of that system's operation. And as Dr. Goldrod said, TOC is a thinking process. It's not a tool like Excel or JIRA. It's a process of thinking. In other words, it's something that's done by a group of humans. Uh, it's a thinking process that enables people to invent simple solutions to complex problems. So let's talk some more about the theory. Um, what's the, one of the great things about the theory is uh, the ability to focus. And Goldrod talks a lot about focusing. Uh, he talks about focus as an art and says that constraints allow us to have a focal point for advancing the entire organization. In other words, it gives us something that we can talk about, something that we can rally around, something that we can socialize within our organization to attempt to bring these uh, a potential slowdown to uh, and publicize it within the organization. As we address and deal with and break these constraints, what we find frequently is that it will expose capacity that we didn't know we had. Uh, sometimes uh, teams that use the theory and successfully break constraints suddenly find that where they were able to only deliver say X amount of software, now they can deliver 1.5 times X or two times X because it's a, an alternative to a bigger spend, which is the one of the ways that we break a constraint is by increasing flow. Uh, that of course means increase of cost. So we wanna be very wary to try and increase flow 
without impacting costs too much. And also it compels us to use the inventory we have and the brain power we have and the tools we have. We don't need any special tools for using this theory. We just need our minds and a group of people who are willing to go through these exercises. When we prioritize constraints and we say, what's the biggest constraint? We do it in one mirror and that's the mirror of what's their impact on profitability of the company. Or another way to say it is, what's the impact on efficiency and throughput of value to our customers? Whatever is the biggest threat to your delivery is the biggest constraint. And I can tell you that uh, the search for, discovery of, prioritizing and breaking of constraints is not a one and done. It's an iterative, continuous, relentless process. It's something we talk about all the time together every day. And uh, the author Bridget Riley said, focusing is not just an optical activity, it is also a mental one. So in order for us to uh, work on constraints, we have to be able to understand them and focus on those constraints. And the, these, the way that we do that is through what's called the five focusing steps. We'll get to that in a moment. The first thing we do is we have to learn at least a little bit about value stream mapping. And what a value stream map is, it's, it's a linear map or sometimes it's collinear, uh, but it identifies every element of process from the initiation to the delivery of elements of value in your value stream or, or your, uh, your company. And what we do in order to apply the theory is we do a throughput analysis on all the elements of the value stream. And we calculate the cycle time for each element. And the cycle time, we calculate that by the lead time plus the execution time. The lead time is the time in between work and the execution time is how long does it take for the work to be done. So if it takes me a week for a, a a message to wind its way to somebody and, and get approved, well, that's a week of lead time. If it takes me a week to write the software, get it out the door, that's a week of execution time. My cycle time is two weeks. My total time to market is my sum of cycle time for my entire value stream, my entire company's value stream. Now we think about value streams as scalable objects. We have a company's large value stream which is made up of smaller value streams organized around solutions or products. We identify the constraints by the impact on two things that we can see. Number one, the cost of delay. In other words, anything that makes us slow to respond, anything that soaks time away from throughput uh, increases the cost of delay and inventory cost. In other words, the cost of the raw materials to build things or the cost of the software that we're writing and, and depositing on our servers. And the way that we apply it is by doing the five focusing steps. And we're gonna go through the five focusing steps right now. As Peter Drucker said, efficiency is doing things right. Effectiveness is doing the right things. We wanna do things right and do the right things. Nope. Uh, I don't, I've never seen it before, uh, but there was a movie made uh, by Goldrot called The Goal, the Movie. I've never actually seen it. I believe it's for sale, but I've never actually saw it myself. Uh, I'm really looking for a copy of it. If anybody sees that, you know, shoot me a line. I'd love to see it, but there's a famous quote from the movie. If you watch the movie or read the book, you'll know that... Uh, Jonah is one of the characters in the book, and Jonah is kind of his mentor, uh, who is a scientist that the, the main character goes to uh, for advice. And one of the quotes from the movie uh, that Jonah says is that efficiencies are not the goal of a business. Why do you think your company built your business? To show off your efficiencies? And of course, the, imp the implication is that we build the business to make money, not to be efficient. Let's talk about the five focusing steps. Five focusing steps are identify, exploit, subordinate, elevate, and repeat. And it's an iterative process. It's not a one and done. It's something that we are going to do multiple times as we meet and talk and innovate around efficiency. Uh, the goal is to discover individually and uh, eliminate individually constraints against the system. 
And the way we do that is we, we identify and then prioritize those constraints. And then once we prioritize them, we take the one that has the most impact and we push it through this system in order to break the constraint. Uh, the goal is what we call organizational focus. In other words, awareness of and being beholden to these constraints on a system which can affect our ability to deliver value. What's a non-constraint? Well, everything in a system that is not a constraint is something that we very specifically call out as something we don't focus on. Or we might say, if it's not broke, don't fix it. We acknowledge non-constraints. They're important to the delivery of value, but we do not focus on identifying and exploiting non-constraints because they are not the cause of our problems. It's the constraints that are affecting our throughput. And although it's not frequently used, I understand that some of his very uh, sincere devotees use the term PUGI, which is an anagram for process of ongoing improvement. And the idea is that we use these five focusing steps iteratively and continuously, periodically, on cadence to identify and crush constraints within our system. The first thing we do is we're given a system and we have to think about this system, identify the constraints, as many as we can, in as much detail as we can. And the reason why we want that detail is because we want to find the one thing that is the worst constraint upon a system. Now, remember, when we say system, frequently we don't mean, you know, like an entire company's, uh, large companies, multiple hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of systems. We're probably going to hone in on a value stream, which is uh, either a manufacturing or a lean term for when you start thinking about a product to the time where it actually ends up being used. We try to find the worst constraint, the one that is the biggest offender, the weakest link in the chain, and we do not focus on or worry about the strong links at all. We do not focus on non-constraints. As John Carmack, the CTO of Oculus said, focus is a matter of deciding what things you're not going to do. It's very important not to squander time focusing on non-constraints. The next thing we do is we have to exploit. And it may seem like a strange sort of negative word, but we continue to use it because it was Dr. Goldrott's word. But what he's, not, what he's saying is, in the sense of exploit means, is that because constraints restrict the flow of value, we exploit it by pushing as much value through the constraint as is without changing it. We maximize our utilization of productivity as much as we can. And while we do that, we're delving into the root causes of the constraint. And the reason we need to do that is we have to, we have to start fighting back against the constraint by isolating it and figuring out how to push more throughput through it. If we completely figure it out, if in other words, the constraint goes away, then we will have broken the constraint. We complete the cycle, we identify the next worst offender, and we continue to do this until our system is perfect. And remember, our theory presumes that every system has a constraint. So you can also say that in some sense, there's no such thing as a system without constraints, but we want to minimize the constraints. And I like this, qu this quote by Lao Tzu, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you are headed. Subordinate, also a curious word, but inside this world, it, it means a very important thing. We know and we've agreed that non-constraints provide and produce value faster than constraints. We know that because the definition of a constraint is something that restricts the flow of value. It's very important when we focus not to overproduce input. In other words, not to stack up input uh, in front of a constraint that will not help. It's also very crucial not to overestimate output. In other words, just because we think we push twice as much through a system does not mean that we're going to get twice as much out in the same time. And what we do is we establish buffers, which we'll talk about in a little bit and WIP monitoring, work in process or work in progress, either is acceptable. The correct term is actually work in process as coined by Deming, but we wanna monitor our WIP because WIP will tell us 
whether we are producing or whether we are thrashing. If our whip is too high, that's usually an indicator that we're taking on too much and trying to push too much through a constraint. Only those who have the patience to do simple things perfectly ever acquire the skill to do difficult things easily. And now is the time to elevate the constraint. Now is the time where we really, really focus on it. We start to put some money into it. We put energy into it, money, people. We hire people if we need more workers. And we continue to measure to show that our impact is there. We never attempt to remediate until we've exploited and subordinated the constraint. Because if we don't completely understand, if we haven't subordinated the constraint, we may risk blowing it up. Investing too soon elevates risk. We want to make absolutely certain that we're making the right decision about how to subordinate a constraint. We have to identify the type of constraint that it is and remediate that constraint with a good. So if we have a people constraint, we can't remediate that with a material solution. We have to, it's a people problem. It's a people solution. As the uh, scientist Galileo said, measure what is measurable and make measurable what is not so. And last, uh, reiterating that this is intended to be an iterative process, meaning that it never ends. It continues as long as the value stream is in existence. And we also want to prevent inertia or inaction from becoming a constraint. Once we elevate and break a constraint, we then walk away from it. We don't focus on it anymore because now it has changed from a constraint to a non-constraint. When we iterate, that's also a great time to bring in some retrospection and, and uh, try to adhere to the 12th principle of the Agile Manifesto, which is periodically we get together and try to do things better. Um, there are very, very, very few, very complex systems that have few constraints. Typically, although not necessarily, the more complex the system, the more numerous and complex are the constraints on that system. And as Walt Disney said, I just watched a great thing. I'll pitch a channel on YouTube called Defunct Land that talks about all of the closed, all the cool attractions that you remember as a kid when you went to Disneyland and Disney World that are now closed. I do not like to repeat successes. I like to go on to other things. So once we break a constraint, we walk away and we focused on the next biggest constraint. This curious uh, phrase, drum, buffer, rope, kind of comes up. It may seem a little unusual. Uh, to me, it evokes something kind of like a, a Rube Goldberg machine or an amazing machine where I kind of pull buttons and or push buttons and pull levers and ropes and things. But it's actually a pretty simple concept and I haven't really thought of a great, a better name for it. But this example should really explain to you what the whole drum buffer rope uh, scenario is and why it's important to use these around constraints. And it's an example that everybody can identify with. The drum is something that creates a, a cadence for feeding a constraint. And I'll get into what that means in a moment. A buffer is a container. And we think about it, I, the reason why it's in single quotes is because it's container. It doesn't have to be a physical container, but sometimes it is a place to make sure that the constraint is never starved for input, that the constraint always has the maximum throughput that can go through. And a rope is the signal that the product is ready to move on to the next stage. So you can imagine an assembly line. So this is like the, the kind of imagination exercise. Imagine an assembly line where people are assembling things in order and someone's beating a drum to keep everybody, you know, to keep everybody <laughs> assembling, like we're on a big biking boat or something. A buffer, that is like a hopper that contains my material to ensure my machine is never starved. Just like I have my birds in the backyard, I think about that buffer. I have to pour the stuff, the bird seed in the top, and then it just disappears. And then the rope, that's a signal that the product is ready to move on, that the, that the processing is complete. So these three things together, we wrap that around a constraint. So here's our example. This is exactly... This is exactly what the theory of constraints is and how we break an important constraint. So I'll leave it to everyone in the room to think about what the constraint is. 
doctor's offices always set multiple times for multiple patients and they have multiple waiting rooms. Had you ever thought, why do doctor's offices have multiple waiting rooms? And the reason why doctors have multiple waiting rooms is because of the drum buffer rope. They don't know it, but it's because of this drum buffer rope way of managing a constraint. And it makes the efficiency of a doctor's office increase by leaps and bounds because the constraint is on the number of doctors and other medical personnel. Everybody wants to see the doctor, but there's only one doctor. So we build this system around the doctor to make sure that the doctor is never has too much input, never knows where he needs to go next or he or she needs to go next, never has a lack of people ready to see him. And we do that by having multiple waiting rooms. Everybody goes to waiting room, then the medical personnel deal with your intake. When the patient is ready to be seen at my doctor, when, when, the, when I'm ready to be seen, the, uh, the nurse will take my chart and put it on the door. And that's a signal to the doctor that I'm ready to be seen. That's the rope. That's the signal that we're ready to move on. So the drum, the cadence that's feeding the constraint, what is that? That's the schedule. That's the, 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 the appointment that you make where multiple people are coming in every couple of minutes or so. What's the buffer? The multiple waiting rooms are the buffer. There's always a patient available for the doctor to see next. We ensure that the constraint is never starved for input. And the rope is a signal that the product is ready to move on to the next stage. When we're ready for the doctor, we put the chart on the wall. When the doctor is done with you, he takes the chart and brings it back to the receptionist. That's another type of, that's another rope signal that you're done, you're ready to move on to the next stage, and then we know someone else can come into the waiting room. This is a classic example of the application of the theory of constraints that we see every day. It's just that maybe the doctors and nurses didn't know that they were uh, obeying or using the theory of constraints to solve a problem, but this is how we solve problems. Now, okay, I understand. Most people here are not doctors. And, but I want you to understand what, the, the, what a constraint is. The constraint here is a person, it's a people constraint. We have the few, a few doctors and many, many, many patients. So we come up with a system to maximize the throughput through the constraint. That's the doctor. The doctor is the constraint. He or she is the, is the one of which we have the least resources. Now, remember when I said, we don't want to throw money at something prematurely. And I said I would explain it later. Well, this is, a, this is a classic case. Doctors have a very high salary. So before you decide to hire another doctor, you better study your workflow and decide if another doctor will improve your throughput. If another doctor will improve your throughput and continue to increase your profitability, then yeah, you should bring another doctor in. Maybe you have too many doctors. If you find that there's one doctor who's never seeing anybody the whole day, well, then maybe you have more doctors than you need. These are the kinds of things that we can think about by looking at our own systems that we're, that we're, look, we're reviewing using the theory of constraints. Okay, so I, I, I usually teach this as a pop-up, but I think in this, I think I probably uh, will just pop up into the chat. I have the chat window up so I can see it. So instead of popping up by unmuting, if you could please pop up into the chat. Uh, and let's just talk about everybody here is familiar with, everybody here has been to a deli counter at a supermarket. So let's just throw into the chat if you can, and I'll read them back out for, for the benefit of the recording. What are the constraints? on a deli counter? What are some of the possible constraints? Everybody's been to a deli counter. You go, you take a number, you ask for some amount of something, and then you walk away. But there's a complex drum buffer rope system around the deli counter. Exactly, deli workers, the person servicing the customer, the availability. In other words, do we have enough food for everybody? Where is the food located? If the food is located far away, and the worker has to walk a long way, it's going to affect our efficiency. Uh, what are some other things? I have a limitation, for example, on the number of slicers at a deli. I only have a couple of slicers. I only have a couple of scales. I have to learn how to share them. 
Right, David, packaging. These are things that constrain our systems. Check out, constrain the systems. They're manual, complex processes that slow down our throughput. So now you as a deli manager, you have to think about how do you buffer those constraints? Well, the easy way that we buffer, and this is my classic example of using a drum buffer rope system, is we have the drum is what? The drum is when you take that, when you get that ticket, now you have an established cadence, or at least you know what order you're going to be dealt with in. Uh, what's the buffer? The buffer is you waiting and then calling your, your YouTube number. Your, your number is you're waiting for someone to call that number. You know what order you're going to be processed in. We still can't affect the fact that some customers want more stuff and some want less, but we can at least handle that. What's the rope when the, when the deli guy calls your number? And that's your signal to go and enter the processing. And there's more constraints even than that, right? We have to say, well, if I, if, if I go up there and I say, I want some smoked turkey, and uh, my friend John Schneider goes over there and says, I want some smoked turkey, well, who gets it first? You know, I have to wait while they slice up John's turkey, and then he walks away, and he's gone, and I'm still waiting. Of course, John, I, we know. It's like, let's say, so that's a perfect example of drum buffer rope. So the question is, how do we apply the same ideas as this drum buffer rope to building software? How do we figure out, how do we corral the problems around the value stream and do it? And the answer is really not all that much more complex than these type of solutions. We have to think about what are our precious, the precious things that require the most time, the most complex, the most cost, and we surround them with a drum buffer rope and we use that to break the constraint. So the, uh, the questions you might have if you were a deli market manager was, oh, uh, how many workers should I have? Well, the answer is that depends. If I'm a 24 hour store, I don't need four guys at the counter at 2 a.m., right? But if it's six o'clock on a Friday, I better have five or six people at that counter or Saturday afternoon or Sunday morning. I better have a bunch of people at the counter. And that's, that's what Theory of Constraints is about. It's about deciding how to use your resources wisely in order to maximize throughput through a system. It's about finding the places where throughput is slowed down, focusing your attention on opening up the throttle and breaking that constraint. Think about what would it be like if we didn't have the deli counter system? I mean, people are rude enough to each other with the deli counter system. Do you ever hear someone say, oh, I was here first. And I'm like, well, just because you're here first, why does that entitle you? My name is before yours in alphabetical order, so I should go first. So it's a good thing we have a little bit of discipline wrapped around the deli counter. Who knows what chaos may be set loose. So I have a, a little case study I'm going to walk through for the last 15 minutes of the talk. And this is an actual real thing that I saw with my own eyes. It happened to me. I saw it. I talked about it. Uh, it's a little embellished to protect the innocent and simplify, but the ideas are sound. And I'm hoping that you can extrapolate from this how you can look at yourself. And you may say, oh, Mitch, you, you know, you're not talking about how I can solve my problems. And I wish I could, but you know, I may not be cognizant of your problems. I don't think we're going to solve them here tonight. Uh, my goal here is to give you a new way of thinking about and looking at your problems so that you can actually crack the code and figure out how to get your throughput up. So here's a real live case study. I, I uh, actually saw this, like I said, with my own eyes. It's a little, little simplified, but this is pretty much it. Um, and here's how it works. This is my motorcycle company. Uh, I get an order if I want to order a bike. And these are the steps that every bike has to go through to get out the door, okay? I have to do the frame first, then I wire the frame, then I paint the frame, I add the power plant, the motor, the gas tank, I add the transmission, then I add the wheels, change the brakes, I test the bike to make sure it won't explode, then I package it up, and then I ship it. And I have no choice. And you can say, oh, that looks like a waterfall. And I'm like, yeah. That's because it is a waterfall. 
because ultimately all value is waterfall. It's just a matter of making sure that the water doesn't fall too far at any one time. But yes, in order to build a motorcycle, we have to start at the at the basics and build out to the to the details. So this is interesting. I now do an assessment. I say, let's I want to look at each one of these steps in manufacturing. I want to figure out where things are getting slowed down because what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to get that bike from order to ship as fast as possible so my customers are happy. I want to make sure I don't skimp on any quality. So I never skimp on testing. I never skimp on packaging because those are things that guarantee customer satisfaction. So I do this little analysis. I'm going to take some notes. And I'm going to go to the I'm going to go to the motorcycle manufacturer. Like I said, let's talk about each of these steps. Or I'm going to go down to the Gemba, if you're familiar with that Japanese word, the place where the work happens, the factory floor, or in this case, Zoom, in our case. And I'm going to look at each one of these steps and I'm going to try and compare them and see if anything pops up in my mind that may look like something that delays our value. So I look at frame fabrication. First thing I noticed that, interestingly enough, for all models, the fabrication is the same. So we don't have to change. When we change models, nothing changes about the, either the frame fabrication or the wiring. And that's very convenient because it means those are non-constraints. Those are things we do not have to look at. We don't have to worry about. We can let them go. We don't focus on those. Frame painting. Oh, that's interesting. When we change the paint color, it's very time consuming and expensive because what we do is we paint the bikes in a special paint room. And the paint room at Harley costs one and a half million dollars each. And every time they go from one color to another color, it's very time consuming because they have to clean the interior and the paint mechanism itself. It's an automated system. So it's actually time consuming, manual, expensive process to change the paint. Plus, here's something I bet you didn't think about. When I go from one color paint to another color paint, I always waste paint. Always. You can't do it without wasting paint. So that's another cost that we might want to think about. Also, I may have custom colors, which means that I may have to mix and I may have to set colors that are not my standard operating procedure, but custom colors are very profitable. So it's something I want to focus on because I know that there's high potential for profit. So now frame painting is starting to look like an interesting candidate to study. All right, let's look at power plant. Well, some models have upgraded engines. So when those engines upgrades are done, we have to change the line around a little bit. So there is some constraint on the power plant section. Uh, for the transmission, everything is the same. Transmission is a transmission. There's no upgrades. For wheels, some models have upgraded wheels. So Every now and then, I'm going to have to have some time to change the line and, uh, and insert the upgraded wheels. Maybe the upgraded wheels are very profitable. So wheels, that's another potential area of constraint because we do soak some time. Whenever we have to shut the line down and refit it for different wheels, there's a cost of delay. Um, chains and brakes, uh, everything is the same for all models. Ready to ship testing and packaging, same for all models. So what we've done is we've identified the non-constraints. We identified the non-constraints by identifying the constraints and then actively ignoring the non-constraints. So once we've identified that the three out of the eight steps that might be causing a constraint, which are frame painting, power plane, and wheels, we have done our job of identifying the constraints. Right, So frame painting, we said there's a constraint of changing paint colors. There's a constraint of custom colors. And we have to think about that because it's something that has a huge impact on the productivity of manufacturing. Also, the power plant, there's some cost of delay when we change power plant to power plant, cost of delay when we change over to wheels. In the second step, where we exploit the constraint, this is where we make the decision, which is the most heinous constraint, okay? Clearly, just based on our little anecdotal discussion about it, the most expensive and the most critical thing that we have to look at here is the frame painting, right? 
Changing paint colors is time consuming and expensive, especially custom colors, which is very profitable. So for all constraints in a system, determine which is the most impactful. We say in this system, it's the, it's the painting. And we have to follow the chains of impact and figure out how we can help work around this bottleneck. So here, we subordinate to the constraint. We delve into the root cause of delay and we figure out how to maximize throughput. Now, how could we, if we were, and I'll just, just guys, if you want to just pop up into the chat, if anybody wants to answer this question, what is a way that we could maximize throughput through the paint room? What's an obvious way we can maximize throughput through a paint room? Anybody want to guess? Okay, good one, Craig. But you are now, you're now spending money, okay? You're right, okay? We'll get to that in a minute, but good guess. John, I knew you'd get the answer. Um, you, so what, the way that we subordinate this is we make sure whenever we're painting any bike, uh, I'll tell you why, David, I, I, it's up to you. In some cases, impact is more important. In some cases, ROI is more important. It's all about what you're attempting to do. I think in the world of the manufacturing metaphor, either one is, is fine. We want to, we want, we're, we're assuming that time to market and win-win situations are a good thing. But like John pointed out, bundling orders of, sim, of, of similar paint color, that solves the problem. That maximizes our throughput. If we know that changing the color in the paint room is expensive and time consuming, then it behooves us to make sure we paint all the white bikes at the same time, and then we paint all the black bikes at the same time. So it changes the order of processing, okay? We don't process each order as it comes in. We bundle the orders together, and we figure out how to buffer the, the existing painting situation so that it the, never runs out. As soon as I finish my last black bike, I know ahead of time that I have to change that um, paint room. So I might have a drum buff or rope situation where when the 14th bike, the next to last black bike comes to the line, I, somebody gets a message that says, okay, after this bike comes through, there's gonna be a cleaning. Sequence colors, thank you, YouTube viewer. All right, and that's an example, once again, of the drum buffer rope. I keep pushing things through the line. I collect them up into a buffer. So I buffer all of my similar things together. I process them all together. You can do the same exact thing with software development. If you have your organization organized for throughput, you can do it. If your organization is not organized for throughput, then you need to get it reorganized so that you can do these kinds of changes and actually see the impact. And we do this drum buffer rope until we come up with a way of breaking the constraint. Now, like Craig pointed out, it's obvious if we let this go for any length of time, it may become obvious and I may go and say, hey, you know, maybe we need to shake it up a little bit and spend some money here. So maybe we elevate the constraint. This is now when we elevate the constraint and now we spend some money and I figured out that if we add another paint facility on the line, it will dramatically impact our overall speed to delivery. And the reason is, is I can always use both paint chambers and I can have two colors going at once, or I now have redundancy built into the system where if I don't have a heavy processing day, I can have one of my paint rooms be idle and be there for redundancy. If a paint room breaks down in this scenario, where do we go? We got nowhere to go. We have one paint room. But if we have two paint rooms, now I have that redundancy built in. And it basically means that I can increase my throughput. I have now broken this constraint. We spent some money. It was expensive. We put another million and a half dollar paint room in there. But man, does it save time because we don't have to change paint as often. We don't hold up the line while we have to change paint. Uh, and we have the redundancy now built into the system where we didn't have it. This is all part of elevating the constraint. This is where we spend the money. What's the analogy in the software world? 
get buy, hire some more testers, hire some more developers, hire some more product managers, hire some more product owners. That's how you break these constraints in the uh, software development concept. Most of the time, most of the constraints that we face in developing software are people constraints, people oriented constraints. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, it's very important that we prove out our hypothesis of change. So I might be a senior vice president who says, pitches to the board of directors, hey, you know, we got to spend a little dough here. And here's why it's worth the $1 million spent. Because if we make the spend, these are the benefits that it will give us. And we make a lean business hypothesis to purchase another painting room. And then we have to make sure that we measure before and we measure after to make sure that the throughput change is real. One thing we can assess is whether the redundancy is helpful, but the first time your line breaks down, you are now producing zero value. So that in and of itself, it might be worth it just for the redundancy. My mantra is measure, change, measure, change, measure, change. We don't measure without the intent to change. We don't change without the intent to measure because we can't tell whether our change is working unless we're measuring meaningful things about the change. And lastly, we now have broken the constraint of frame painting. It is no longer the worst constraint. Now we go, what's the next most impactful constraint? We may decide it's the power plant. And now we go after the power plant. We may decide it's the wheels. Here we decided it's the power plant. And the questions that we ask for the next most impactful constraint, what are the options? What will have the most impact? What will reduce the most waste? What will get our product out to our customers faster? And most importantly, what are workers and leaders going to embrace? Okay, we can't break constraints by making workers and leaders do unreasonable things. We have to have them on the side of change. And those are our real life applications of the theory of constraints. And uh, this brings us with uh, two minutes to spare to the end of our talk. So thank you all very much. I'm available for a little while for another half hour uh, for question and answer. So uh, thanks everybody for coming. I'd be happy to take your questions. Feel free to unmute or type them in the chat box, whatever you feel more comfortable doing. Thank you, David. Thank you, Craig. Appreciate it very much. Please feel free to jump on with some questions. Doesn't have to be about TOC. I can try to answer anything. Thanks, Steve. Nobody has any questions about TOC, huh? Oh, I'll just hang out here for a while and we'll see if anybody is still hanging on. Yes. Okay. Good question, Laura. Uh, Laura asks, uh, what suggestions would you give for introducing TOC to my organization? Well, I will tell you, here's what I would do is I would get myself a Kindle copy of the goal. It's a really, it's actually not a bad book. It's kind of entertaining and useful at the same time, which I know is kind of rare, but you know, that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. And um, I would share that book with people who, you know, first off, read the book yourself, by all means, please do that. And then uh, share it, you know, share it with people who you want to experience, you know, what, what it's like to, uh, to be in this world of, of constraints and thinking about things in this new way. Uh, there are some uh, great videos out there by Dr. Goldrod himself. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, uh, due to cancer a few years. I think 2006, he passed away, regrettably. He was an absolutely brilliant, brilliant man. And uh, his, that, the book is, to me, the key to it all. If you read and understand that book, you will definitely be able to speak to TOC and introduce it to your organization. Use the metaphors 
that Dr. Goldrot uses and you'll, you'll be in pretty good shape. Can I speak to issues with one person needing to train and do work while trying to scale? Hmm. <coughs> well, this is not really, this is kind of a TOC issue because what we have to do sometime is um, we have to sometimes drum buff a rope around ourselves. Okay, so that's how I'll speak to Christina's question. Uh, if I am constrained in my time, for example, remember we said there, there are time constraints or temporal constraints or time constraints, then what I have to do is I have to use a drum buffer, drum buffer rope uh, in order to control my own activity. So what do I do? I have to make sure, for example, that I allocate my time so that I set time aside for all of the things that I need to do. Example, I have a whole job that I have to do every day. And I also have to do a whole bunch of other stuff that's not my job every day. I have to do things like, you know, be active on social media and create presentations for training and you know, create videos and slide decks to keep everybody trained. And I have to do all that stuff and I have to do my job. So I have to allocate my time. And what I do is I say, well, uh, I'm gonna block out two hours for two days and I'm not going to any meetings and I'm gonna sit and I'm gonna do my work. And if people don't like it, too bad. This is what, I, this is what we have to sometimes do in order to uh, get the job done. So it's really all about, yeah, that's what it's all about, getting the job done. Sometimes we have to have that. Um, would you choose TOC over lean? I would say no, and I'll give you a complex answer. The reason why I say no is because TOC is part, it's, it's a theory inside the big theory of lean theory. It's aligned with Sig Sigma in that it is interested in identifying and eliminating waste. So to me, Six Sigma is kind of an inside out approach to TOC. I find TOC and the thinking processes to be a little more insightful, a little more collaborative and generate more innovation than some of the you know, canvas techniques or the old school uh, program management techniques. Uh, uh, forgive me, I'm not uh, uh, appreciative inquiry. I'm not, for, uh, it, wait a minute, uh, is that a, uh, I don't want to make an idiot out of myself. And, and uh, but is that a, um, is that a uh, liberating structure? I don't remember uh, appreciative inquiry. How do you handle constraints on improvement themselves? For example, adding new team members may solve the people constraint has a cost in terms of recruitment. That's why, well, that's a good question from, from Jason which is that how do you handle constraints on improvements themselves? That's why we say you have, you can't handle constraint on improvement themselves. You have to handle it as a system because every change that you make to a system is going to have multiple impacts and not just on your throughput. It will have a cost impact. It will have a time impact. It will have a material or a space impact. And yeah, we have to think about all these things when we elevate a constraint what will be the ultimate cost of change? And then we compare the cost of change to the cost of delay. If the cost of change is less than the cost of delay, we do it. That's really more of the language of traditional program management. And like Stephen pointed out, WIP. That's, WIP is a way to tell almost everything you need to know about a system is by examining its WIP. Frequently, people will come to me as a coach and say, Mitch, I have too many things to do. <clears throat> I can never get my work done. You know, before I finish something, someone's asking me to do something else. And I need a strategy. I need some, something I can grasp onto, something that I can use as a tool every day to make my life better. And I said, well, here's my advice. Here's a great tool all of us can use at no cost. The word no. And sometimes you have to say to people, hey, I'd love to help you, but I don't have time to help you because I already have commitments to my clients. And sometimes that word no can be super powerful. And uh, in an agile world, in an empowered world, we should be able to say no, or as I would say, as polite people would say, no, thank you, or not right now, or not yet. 
or not today. All of those things work. But you have to decide on a daily basis if you want to look at your own daily work value stream and apply the theory of constraints to that. I do it all the time. How do I do it? Well, when people ask me to do stuff, I, I make a JIRA ticket for it and I stick it in a backlog. Nobody looks at it. Nobody cares. That's not there for anybody else. It's there for me so that I can organize the things that I need to do. If somebody else wants to look at it, that's fine, but it's not there to show off to people. It's my buffer. It's my buffer that tells me the things that are waiting for me to do. And then when I have some time, what do I do? I look at my personal backlog. I prioritize it. I take the top priority and that's the next thing I do. And that's how I apply it through your constraints to my daily work. How do you apply it in the software world? Well, WIP is probably the biggest indicator of where you have trouble. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to companies that have trouble with throughput because of geographical limitations. We all know COVID has hammered us from having co-located teams. Also, I'll, I'll be frank, uh, we use overseas and, and geographically inconvenient labor uh, that we have sometimes to coordinate between uh, our staff in Poland and our staff in Redwood City. And I can tell you, it can be, it can be difficult. It's a constraint. It's a, it's a geographical constraint. And uh, Christina said, the person is constrained because they have too much work responsibility, but not enough time to train a powerhouse. Right. So what, like I said, anytime I'm asked to do something, I, if I really, I try to do everything I'm asked to do. Uh, so I definitely do everything I'm told to do. And I try to do everything I'm asked to. And sometimes I will just say no. I just, as a matter of fact, I said no three times today. Uh, Schneider asked, does TOC apply to complex innovation and delivery? It does. The problem is that when we look at a complex system, complex, remember I said complex systems have complex constraints. The trick of looking at a complex system is to scale down the view to the point where we have, instead of a, a value stream of 100 steps or 20 steps, we try to take a systems view with as few steps as possible and measure around as few steps as possible. We identify the big constraint. Then that constraint itself, the big constraint, the complex constraint, we now treat that constraint as a system. So we scale, we kind of drill in to that constraint. And now we treat that as a system. We delve for the root cause, we drill down into the, the detailed value stream, we do more detailed measurements about the constraint, and then we treat that constraint as a whole system. That's what elevating is really all about. We, we drill down and we focus on that constraint. We treat it as though it's the only thing in the world, as though it is the system. And that applies to anything. It's all a matter of what, uh, what level you're looking at, or what level of scale you're looking at it. Big systems, complex systems will have complex problems, complex problems, we want to think of simple solutions to complex problems, but frequently solutions to problems are typically as complex as the problem. Uh, how do you find that removing a constraint makes the next? Oh, that's a good question, Stephen. Uh, do you find that removing a constraint makes the next thing become the next big constraint? Yes, frequently this will happen, is that you will break a constraint and then you will discover either another constraint that you didn't know about because the first constraint was hiding it, or sometimes you will discover to one's great delight that there's actually resources and inventory that you were not aware of that will now be available. So when you break a constraint, it can really go either way. Sometimes when you break a constraint, it will free you up and you'll discover more constraints and you'll be able to break them too. Sometimes when you break a constraint, you'll discover, you'll get down to the root cause and all of a sudden you say, oh, wow, I had no idea we could do this much work with these few people, okay? It all depends on how you approach it and really how you measure it without impacting its behavior. But really good question, Stephen. Any other questions before we uh, keep rolling along? And yeah, and I always say, you know, we say we don't, I, just back to David's question, I don't choose any methodology over any other methodology. 
I use every tool in my tool belt, everything I can think of, every trick in the book to try and make our company's value streams more efficient. So I'll use TOC, but I can tell you it's not super widely known and it's not super widely understood. And it's still awkward to talk in general terms about how to apply it in our sort of situation, but it's not incompatible with Lean or Six Sigma or any other methodology. It's just a way of achieving a result. And it's a good way, it's a way of introducing these thinking processes into your business process.